Our scripture reading today involves the absolute most commonly searched passage in the Bible. If you can't tell uh, from the fact that it, we cover uh, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, it is, of course, John 3, 16. Hands down, the most famous verse there is. As this is a gospel reading today, let us please stand. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it's not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus answered, How is it possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? Then Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's Spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. It's the same with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus asked, how are these things possible? Jesus answered, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe when I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. But just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him would not die, but have eternal life. God didn't send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth and comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that, they, that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. There's a uh, Facebook group for licensed local pastors in Louisiana. And uh, one of the other members there posted a cartoon earlier this week. It was two panels side by side, exact same picture. And it's uh, obviously the father talking to Jesus. His voice is coming from the cloud. The first one on the left is labeled transactional. And the vo there's a voice from the cloud saying, you're down there to die, to appease me for how mad I am at everyone. Now the second panel is labeled transformational. And there's a voice from the cloud saying, you're down there to show the humans how to live and love. The caption on that whole cartoon was, your theology really does matter. There's a major conflict between the idea of transactional theology and transformational theology. All really having to do with the question, of what is the source of of salvation? What's the reasoning behind all of this that we read in the Bible? What's the reasoning behind Jesus coming to earth? Is it so that he would pay that price with his sacrifice? Or is it to show us how to live? To give us his ministry and his example?
Now, Nicodemus here, in today's passage, he's coming from a pharisaical point of view. There's a very transactional uh, theology to how the Pharisees were brought up to believe. I got to tell you, the more I look into the character of Nicodemus Ben Gurion, the more I like him. I think he's a really fascinating character. And in fact, he's one of the few people in the Gospels that gets a whole character arc. Aside, of course, from Jesus and uh, the disciples, for the vast majority of other people written about in those four books, they're in for a scene, and they're out. Or maybe there's someone that, whose life Jesus turns around, but it's more like flipping on a switch, like with the Samaritan woman at the well, or the demoni <coughs> excuse me, the demoniac uh, from whom Jesus cast out the demons. They were one way, they met Jesus, and then immediately their lives are transformed. But Nicodemus is a slow arc. We actually only see him three times in the Gospels, all in John. And this is the very first time. We see someone who is a wealthy, upper-class elite. Someone who's part of the uh, ruling council. Someone who absolutely has a say in the way society is run in his area. Someone who has been very successful despite the fact that he's an outsider to the Romans who are really running the government. And yet we see him today seeking information about who Jesus is and about the source of his power. You see, Nicodemus has been taught to believe that what he's doing in today's passage is wrong because he's meeting with the enemy. He's meeting with this crazy heretic, right? He's meeting with somebody who is teaching people that what the Pharisees are teaching and what the Sadducees are teaching, you know, basic common Jewish knowledge, is wrong. He's meeting with a traitor. And yet, he knows that there's something going on here, something beyond just this, this accusation that he must be of the devil. Jesus' teachings are contrary to what the Pharisees were brought up to believe, but there's something about the way he's saying it, something about what he's saying, something about what he's doing that makes Nicodemus believe in his heart of hearts there's got to be something to it. second time we see Nicodemus is just a few chapters later. The Pharisees are uh, all kind of piling on the judgment train for Jesus and Nicodemus is the one saying, well, guys, hold on, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe you ought to investigate the situation more thoroughly. Let's not go off half-cocked here. Let's make sure we have all the evidence. Let's make sure we know what it is that's really going on with this, guys, before we pass judgment. The, the last time we see Nicodemus, he's progressed. He's gone from this feeling that maybe something is up with Jesus, to warning the other Pharisees, let's not be too hasty here, I think you're wrong, to eventually, at the crucifixion, coming to Jesus' grave with a personal donation of 75 pounds of myrrh for that burial. He's finally okay with letting people know that he is more concerned with the light that Jesus has to offer than he is with protecting that position of privilege that he is accustomed to. When Jesus sees him, I don't think he sees that wealth and that privilege. Let's face it, the Bible's full of examples of God not paying at all any attention to the things that get people's attention, right? God's concerned with the heart. And what Jesus sees in Nicodemus is a heart 
in turmoil. Nicodemus is at the end of his rope. He's questioning everything he's been taught. He's just crazed by this idea that there's something wrong and that this Jesus guy seems to know what that answer is. So he comes to him secretly in the night because he's ashamed of what he's doing. He knows that just there's got to be more than what he's been presented with. <coughs> and intellectually, he knows that you know, this Jesus guy and his followers, they're, they're probably just madmen. But in his gut, he can't accept that. There has to be something more to his ministry. There has to be some real truth behind it because he's doing things nobody else is doing. And he's speaking with an authority of heavenly matters that just, it makes him believe that he must have a knowledge that Nicodemus just doesn't. Jesus is seeing in Nicodemus the same thing that he sees in the hearts of people all around the world every single day. We may be told by society that, you know, that, Man in the sky fairy tale is ridiculous. But we know. And every day there's people who are so conflicted because they know there has to be something more to it. That maybe society, believe it or not, is wrong. And that all these people for thousands of years are seeing something that maybe they need to see too. Jesus sees someone who's yearning for truth, needing to go beyond the black and the white of the religion that they've been raised into and into a faith that is deep and colorful and resplendent. So he breaks him. He absolutely breaks down Nicodemus's paradigm of how the world works. I imagine Nicodemus probably left this conversation like on the verge of tears because everything about how he knows the world works is coming down right here. Because remember, Nicodemus was raised with that transactional theology. And by transactional, I mean kind of like a transaction you have at the store. I'm going to go by Walmart after church today. I hand Walmart $4, Walmart gives me a bag of potatoes. Done. Simple. End of transaction. Transactional theology means there's a tit for tat. There's a quid pro quo. You do this for me, I do this for you. They see holiness the same way. Holiness is all about following very specific rules. It's about making the proper sacrifices to God to earn his love. It's about living by the letter of the covenant. It's coming from this wrong worldview about why we live the way we do. If we do this for God, if we do X, God will bless us. Jesus says that's not right. <laughs> It's too centered on what we're doing. Because that view of salvation says that we're the ones that are responsible for our own salvation. And you know what? It's kind of flattering, isn't it? Might be kind of empowering. Yeah, yeah, of course, I'm the one responsible. I can do it on my own. Well, that's also pretty terrifying, too. And Jesus is trying to snap Nicodemus out of this way of thinking because it doesn't give the proper credit to the one who is responsible for your salvation. And that is the Lord Almighty. So he begins to describe his relationship, his reason for being there in metaphor. He compares himself to the snake that Moses lifts up in the desert. Y'all remember that scene? Throughout the uh, 40 years wandering in the desert, the Israelites, they were grumpy, to put it extremely mildly, right? 
And in one of the instances of the times where they had gotten way too comfortable mumbling their curses about God, they were beset by venomous snakes. But God gave Moses some directions. And Moses followed those directions, and in doing so, he built this bronze snake that he lifted high on a pole. And whenever anyone who was bitten by one of those venomous serpents would look on that bronze snake, all of a sudden they were fine. They, were li- they would live. Although they were filled with toxins, they were going to pull through it okay. They found that su- their salvation by looking on that snake. Jesus is saying he is fulfilling the same role as that snake, metaphorically speaking. If you look to him, you'll be saved. He's the bringer of salvation. He's the one who will give us safety from harm. He's the source of blessing if only we will believe. Even though we are surrounded by toxic a, a, a toxic world so much so that it gets within us it affects us it poisons our own hearts if we look to Jesus we'll find safety from that poison venom the reason that he was sent is not just to pay this price He says he was sent because of God's love. There's the motivation behind that that makes all the difference. He says, Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever should believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Nick, buddy, God loves you. You're not just earning God's blessing by following these rules and making these sacrifices. God loves you already. He loves you radically. He loves you unconditionally, even though sometimes you disobey him and you spit in his face. He loves you so much that he's willing to, to send his son into this world and show you how to do it right. Jesus was sent into this world to save us from that life of sin, a life that's turned away from God and more towards what feels good for us, what we deem to be good and right. The ministry of Jesus was all about showing us how things should be done. It was about showing us God's love for us. It was about showing us the power of God's name. It was about transforming us the way he does to Nicodemus throughout the Gospel of John. The way, let's face it, He does to pretty much everyone he has a conversation with throughout the Gospels, except some of those other Pharisees. See, God didn't send Jesus to die. God sent Jesus knowing that he would suffer and die. There's a difference there. And again, that's all about intent. It's not just a transaction. You're there to die. Simple. End of story. If that was the case, may as well have let Herod do his work uh, you know, 30 years prior to this conversation Jesus is having right now. What was absolutely vital to that was the ministry. Because as Jesus goes on to say, This is my personal favorite verse in the entire Bible. 
God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world would be saved through him. Like that snake in the desert, Jesus came to the world to be lifted up so that people could look to him and not die, but find salvation. That's why Jesus was concerned with every single person because he's there for every person to have the opportunity to look up and find eternal life. Guys, God is not cruel. He is a father figure. That's not to say there's no discipline. Sometimes there's some pretty harsh things. But God is not cruel. I know one of the uh, kind of sarcastic criticisms you occasionally hear atheists pitching out about Christianity is this idea that God came to the earth to die painfully to save us from what he would do to us if we didn't believe that he would die painfully. That doesn't even make sense. But again, that's because it's coming from this view of a quid pro quo, a transactional view, that it's not about tr transformation of us. It's just about paying that bill. I would dare say John Calvin, as intelligent and wonderful a theologian as he was, I think he was very incorrect with his idea that there are elect. Which means that there are people in the world, all over the world, the vast majority, in fact, who were brought into being not through the love of God, but simply with the purpose of eventually burning. No. No. Jesus says himself, he came to the world so that the world might be saved through him. He doesn't say so to, that a couple of people could be saved through him. He doesn't say so that only the Jews could be saved through him. He says the world. Urbis. That's the whole thing. All of us. And what's so important to remember is the attitude behind that, the motivation behind that. Some of you may remember a pastor by the name of Jonathan Edwards. He was a Puritan preacher. Actually uh, was pretty prominent just a couple decades before John Wesley came to the U.S. He delivered a famous sermon in Connecticut in 1741. If I'm wrong, you know, feel free to correct me. <laughs> Called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. There was a very famous line from that one, let me tell you, stuck with me. I remember the first time I read this for class and I was horrified. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over a fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. I don't know what on earth Jonathan Edwards was dealing with in his personal life that he read the Gospels and got that message from it. Because every time I read, what I hear is that God loves you so much he would give up his only son to suffer and die so that he could show you his love so that he could show you the example of how to live. That is not a God that hates us. That's a God that loves us in a way I, I can't even describe well. But let's face it, look, there are some harsh truths that come in, in the package with Christianity, right? There's some things that are not easy to accept, some uh, tough pills to swallow, so to speak. We're sinful by nature. We're broken. We have a penchant for turning away from everything that is good 
to follow our own paths. We're incapable of saving ourself by ourselves by our own power. And even our best efforts are like filthy rags compared to the pure perfection and righteousness that's God Almighty. But the good thing about those is that they're followed by a very wonderful truth that God loves us anyway. So much, so radically, so passionately that he sent his own son to show us the way. I was asked in a recent course of study class what the most significant verse in the Bible is to me personally. What's the one verse that forms the basis of my personal theology? What's the verse that is the lens through which I view everything else? And everybody around the class was given you know, a lot of wonderful answers. And I think I threw the uh, professor a curveball. So I said, John 3, 17. She said, 16. I said, 17. She said, really? Why is that? Remember, that's God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but the world should be saved through him. I said, that's the motivation for every single other verse in Scripture. That's the reason it all happened. It's the why. The why we're here. The why we look to the Bible in the first place. It's the center of everything that goes on. And because I need it to be my center too. Amen and amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for the love that you've shown us. Help us to grow in your image and move towards perfection and love that we may shine your light upon others. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.